What's the problem? It's co-ed within the buildings, not within the rooms. So? So the polite thing for you to do is go down to the housing office, tell them there's been a mistake, and they need to get you boys new rooms. No, 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 no. We were here first. Besides, it's your fault. Why didn't you use Alexandria, whatever your full name is? Alex is my full name. Well, it sounds like a man's name to me. I think it's lovely. Three college roommates become involved in an intense and sometimes passionate relationship. Special guest Dan DeVenny joins us to chat about pooping in co-ed bathrooms, judgmental looks from librarians, and an anticlimactic pregnancy scare. Then we find out if threesome stands the test of time. James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? James says gladiator with the blood Alan says as a father blah blah It's the test of time James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? Test of time James and Alan have their say Do the movies you love still hold up today? Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Test of Time. I'm your host, James Brief, and joining me as always is my buddy, my pal, the director of the episodes, Alan Noah. Hello, that's me, and for this movie called Threesome, we have a threesome, kind of, of sorts (laughs) today, I guess. Uh, Special guest Dan DeVenny is back on the show. Dan, how are you? I am fabulous. Thank you for having me back. Of course, of course. So for... Anyone who maybe missed the last time you were here, you joined us to talk about Tombstone. And when you had initially emailed into the podcast, you said that you would come on to talk about Tombstone and Threesome. And first off, I just was a little bit taken aback by those two titles, that those were the two that you picked. And, you know, you you mentioned on that episode that you liked westerns and you're kind of a western guy but you know people can like different things people can have different interests you know you can love westerns and comedies and rom-coms and whatever but i was like huh tombstone and threesome it's an odd pairing kind of so what's your relationship with the movie threesome i saw it in the theater and for some reason i fell in love with it and i don't know why because it is a very out there movie but i i fell in love with it and i i've watched it many times and it's just it's different to me (laughs) okay fair we had our friend mike khan on a while back and he joined us to talk about the movie boiler room and he said that he picked that movie because he worked in the actual boiler room i'm gonna be honest the thought crossed my mind that Oh, Dan, maybe he's uh Oh, I'm a swinger. Full on. Yeah, maybe <laughs> may, maybe you're in a thruple or something and you know, this is a judgment-free zone. That's fine. Okay, cool. You know, we wouldn't have a problem with that just for the record. Um for any of our other listeners who may be super into threesomes or whatever, that's cool. I had never seen this movie. I feel like I had seen it maybe like in the video rental store. James, had you seen it before? This is actually a rare film that I had actually never seen and never heard of. You know, it's the kind of film I feel like I would have heard of because in 1994, I would have been 14 years old when this film came out. And I would have been like, what? There's a movie called Threesome. As long as I even knew what that was, there's a possibility I didn't know what that was. So (laughs) maybe it wouldn't have enticed me, but... uh, Dan, you're a couple of years older than us, but you were, instead of like a freshman in high school, you were probably like a senior in high school or something. No, I was college, second year of college. You know, it definitely the, the title might have been more enticing for you. You know, it's like there's this uh, show now, Mindy Kaling, uh, she produced it. And I don't know if she titled it, but it's absolutely brilliant because it's called The Sex Life of College Girls. And it's like, if there's a title that's going to entice people to watch it, that's certainly got a shot. Uh, you know, once they, they, you get the title, uh, you, know, you got to have something behind it. But, uh, you know, certainly Threesome is definitely an eye-catching title. 
Yes. And where is this Mindy Kaling show streaming? HBO Max. Yeah, I think it's it. yeah, <laughs> I'll, HBO Max. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> it's very, very good. I really like it. It's not as seedy as it sounds. Like there's sex, but it's like it's a very sex positive show and it's a female focused show. I do enjoy it. And, you know, it reminds hmm. me of uh, when we were reviewing that film, uh, PCU, uh, I think about this a lot, that that band, they name themselves Everybody Gets Laid so that they can announce on the college radio, tonight at the pit, everybody gets laid. And then, of course, everyone runs down there. And because the band happened to be good uh, or they brought uh, George Clinton, it becomes a big party. So, you know, if you have a good show like Sex Life of College Girls and it's something behind it, it'll, you know, that got them in the door and you keep them there. Um, you know, Threesome remains to be seen. Yeah, Threesome is not the great movie that <laughs> I want it to be. You know, I usually rent these movies on DVD from the library and usually what happens is the librarian, who is quite often a sweet older lady, will look at the DVD and say, oh, this is a great movie. And I'll smile and say, yeah, thank you. And sometimes they just kind of check me out and don't make eye contact. And you can probably guess what happened when I took out this <laughs> particular DVD. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Um, and also... I took it out a long time ago. It kept auto renewing because, uh, you know, we pushed this recording back a bit. So uh, I had the DVD out of the library for a very long time. I might get some more strange looks at the library because of that. You know where I saw the film? I actually found it one place. I found it straight up on YouTube, not YouTube for rent. It was just streaming. They crop out a little bit of the corner. So I guess like, you know, the uh, the copyright bots don't quite pick up on it. I watched it on my DVD. You own it on DVD, huh? Yeah. Okay. But let's give our listeners a, a recap of the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it. It's about three college students named Eddie, Stewart, and Alex. Eddie and Stewart are best bud doormates who unexpectedly get a third roommate who's a woman named Alex. At first, the living situation is awkward, but eventually sparks fly and things get complicated. Stewart likes Alex, but she isn't attracted to him. Alex has a hots for Eddie, but Eddie questions his sexuality and is unsure if he has the same feelings for Alex. Eddie then realizes that he likes Stuart, but Stuart is straight and not interested in being more than friends with Eddie. Eventually, this three-way friendship leads to, well, the name of the movie is Threesome. So I normally would ask you at this point, James, is this a big hit at the box office? This could not have been a big hit at the box office, right? Actually, uh, the film did not do very well, and it sold barely any tickets. I think it sold uh, one ticket in uh, Toledo, Ohio. I think, uh, Dan, you might have been the one person who uh, who saw this film. That was me. But uh, the, the film had a $10 million budget. Unfortunately, the film opened on April 8th, 1994, and that was the day that Kurt Cobain died. And Whoa. that certainly is not the weekend you want to be like, it's threesome, woohoo! Like, you know, the film wound up opening up at number five uh, with $4 million. And uh, it wound up actually making $15 million in the, in the box office. Uh, rule of thumb is you, you kind of want to make two and a half times. So, But the thing is, I don't think in this situation... I don't think they did spend that much money on marketing because I never heard of this film. And I watched a lot of TV as a kid and I probably was watching MTV and I would guess that they'd probably want to advertise on a, a television show like that uh, station. But um, it actually made 15 million and I guess a couple people bought the DVDs. So it wasn't the flop I thought it was going to be. You know, I thought it was going to be like, you know, a half a million dollars. But, you know, it eked out some money. I guess good for them. You know, when the movie starts, it did something that I really, really liked right out of the gate. In the opening credits, it shows all three names of the three main stars at the same time on screen. You know, it has Lara Flynn Boyle and Josh Charles and Stephen Baldwin. And I right away was like, that's great. This is a story about a threesome, three main characters and there's no main character, singular, it's three main characters, 
plural. And I was like, that's really smart. I like that. I just like that as an artistic choice. And then that lasted a about half a second, because then right away we start hearing Josh Charles doing voiceover. And then all of a sudden it's not three equal main characters. It's one guy telling his story and the other people are there too. And I know I'm a broken record with the voiceover thing, but man, the voiceover in this movie is really fucking terrible and excessive yeah it is and i think for whatever reason in my head when i think of movies with bad voiceover the one that always springs to mind is varsity blues and that's probably not the worst offender for whatever reason that's the one i think of and i think it's because that movie opens with james vanderbeek doing a really terrible southern accent where he's like (laughs) in texas Football is laugh. And you hear the voiceover while you're seeing all of the footage of how in Texas people really love football and it's completely unnecessary. Also, like the opening credits to Friday Night Lights, you saw that Texas loves football without voiceover. So that was my like go to movie of this is why voiceover is bad. I think I might have a new go to movie (laughs) for why voiceover is bad. It's threesome. Yeah, there's so much of it. Yes, throughout the entire movie. And I admit I hadn't watched it in about a year and a half, and I didn't remember all of that voiceover. And that was one of the things I wanted to apologize, first off, for making you guys watch this, and for all of the voiceover. (laughs) I mean, I don't mind voiceover as much as Al, but Al has successfully argued to me about the flaws of uh, of voiceover, but I, I don't I don't hate it as much as he does. I definitely dislike the voiceover at certain parts of this film for what it does. But uh, but when I do listen to voiceover, I can usually sense Al's anger like <laughs> miles away, so I can feel that telepathically. Well, I'm glad. But my main thing with voiceover is sort of what I was saying about Varsity Blues. When the voiceover is telling you something that you clearly see, that's just really annoying. And this movie does that a lot. There's an early scene when the three of them are out getting pizza and... Alex and Eddie are really hitting it off, but Stuart is like sad because he's not in the conversation. You see that in the scene, but then the voiceover comes on and tells you Stuart really felt sad because Alex and I were connecting and he wasn't like, no shit. I'm watching that happen. Why are you telling me that? And a different annoying thing of voiceover is when something really important happens in voiceover and it's just kind of like, Eh, whatever, it's just a thing. Eddie comes out in voiceover. He realizes that he's gay, and it's just like a line of VO. Like, oh, it was at that moment I realized I was gay. It's like, you know, not for nothing, I would think that would be like a big deal. Yes. You know, like the movie kind of treats it as a big deal. This is a, a major revelation for this character. He thought he was straight, and now he has discovered that he's gay. That should be something that we see in the movie, not that we are told in voiceover. It cheapens this important moment for him. I agree completely. And several times in the movie, it's big things like that that are just cheapened by the voiceover. Yes. And while watching it, and then while thinking about the movie, I was wondering if the voiceover is there to kind of patch over the bad acting or the bad screenplay. And I think I ultimately landed on yes. both. I agree. Especially Stephen Baldwin. He's the weakest actor of the three. Apologies to you, Stephen Baldwin, if you're listening. But you can tell that he is the least good actor of the three. Right? Yes. Yes. I mean, uh, for Lara Flynn Boyle, uh, she's generally a, she's a good actress. In this film, she doesn't necessarily have much to work with. But if her direction is to be seductive, she's trying her best to seduce Josh Charles' character. I really like Josh Charles. I've always wanted him to be a 
bigger actor than uh, he turned out to be. And, and, and no, I mean, no, no disrespect to him. I think he was on the, the Good Wife for like ten years or something. I mean, I probably made bank. But uh, ever since uh, I saw him in Dead Poet Society. When you saw him and Ethan Hawke and you're like, wow, these two are like the best and they're going to go on to have the hugest careers. Like I always thought like he'd be like Ethan Hawke territory. And, you know, I, I just don't think people appreciate him as much. He was in this fantastic uh, series called Sports Night. Yeah. And uh, from Aaron Sorkin. Right. Unfortunately has laugh track, which would have been a million times better if it was if it didn't have the laugh track. But uh, it's not a laugh track. It's live audience. But I mean, the laughter track. Um, but I want to agree that, uh, yeah, Stephen Baldwin is probably the weakest of them. I think he plays his role where it's written, too, to be fair. I don't think a better actor would have necessarily played it much better. Um, they don't necessarily look the part of college kids. I think they look a little older. But yeah. um, I think they're doing the best with what they've got. Yeah, I mean, it's a bad script, for sure. Yeah, it, it, it kind of is. Um, the whole premise of the film is that a girl is assigned to live with them, and they say it's because her name is Alex, and because of that, the school puts her in a, a boy's room because they assume that Alex has to be a boy, and that they can't rectify this for, like, six months. I mean, put something in there. Like, there's just absolutely no dorms, and it's there's nothing left. I, I don't know. There, was, there had to be a better reason than they mixed up the name Alex. I mean, I'm pretty sure certainly in 1993, they were putting gender uh, on their uh, college applications. So uh, I just thought that this was a really weak premise to put the three of them together. Agreed. At one point, like someone says to Alex that they need official documentation in order to prove her gender, which definitely made me think of, you know, all of these anti-trans rules and laws and regulations that you see now. But you wouldn't imagine seeing something like that at a university. Like in my mind, I imagine that like all universities are super liberal. I'm sure that's not true. I'm sure there are conservative universities out there. I don't think they ever say where this college is, do they? No. It seems like a liberal arts, coastal elite sort of institution, right? Yes. It is a kind of like a sexual coming of age is what I think they were trying to do. And in college, I was trying to figure out where I was and what I was then, too. I think that's why I bonded to it. But overall, the premise is extremely weak. Right, right. I remember when I was in college, there were co-ed bathrooms in the dorm. Yeah. <laughs> no, you didn't have that, Dan? No. 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 There was one literally directly across the hall from my dorm room and I never used it because I was just afraid of what I might see in there. It had no appeal, but for some people like, yeah, who cares? It's a bathroom, whatever. But as a college freshman, that kind of blew my mind. I did have uh, also co-ed bathrooms in uh, my dorm and it was like an unwritten rule that nobody ever pooped in the co-ed bathroom but there was this one guy who, no pun intended, seriously, he did not give a shit because he would give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I can sort of see how the idea of two guys sharing a dorm with a girl would be a kind of mind-blowing type of thing you know of like whoa can you imagine what that would be like and once they kind of realize that there is all of this sexual tension between them and they decide that they're not going to act on it because that would ruin their friendship i was honestly kind of impressed by their restraint because they don't actually hook up until like about an hour into the movie and then they just kind of like kiss and fool around a little bit and then the actual threesome doesn't come till even later almost the end yeah 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 exactly and the thing about college students that they are typically known for is being horny and impulsive and not necessarily having great self-control and honestly their self-control to me, it was just as unrealistic as Alex getting put in their dorm room because her name is Alex. You know, like it's right up there. Agreed, 100%. <laughs> 
there is real, real chemistry there. And they're just like, they decide they're going to keep it in their pants and they do. Hmm. They don't have to, but they just choose to. One thing that just bothered me about the their characters was that I think they're kind of dicks. Um, I think <laughs> we're supposed to like them. And there is a scene when uh, one of the guys has a date and they bring this date over. The other people there are really, I mean, the, the word is, I guess it would really be a straight up bullying. They're talking about her like very loudly and she could hear everything. Like, why were they being so mean to her? I found that very uncomfortable. I had my bullying experiences and I just still, I felt very bad for this woman and that would be fine if we're supposed to hate these people or if there's going to be some kind of huge redemption. And they do explain that the, the, like part of their little cult is that they've been isolating everyone else from their, you know, their friend circles. But um, I just thought that was unnecessarily cold. There could have been a comedic way that they could have uh, isolated people. Because the, there was a hint around the dorm that they were the weirdos, and that's fine. That's where they got their isolation. But I didn't think they had to be actively be dicks. And I, I, I did not like that about them. Well, I think that's part of like their thing, is that no one else can come into their, I almost said circle, but triangle would yeah. clearly be more appropriate. Because I, I was thinking before that happened, okay, if the three of them have all of this pent up sexual tension and they're not hooking up with each other, well, they're on a college campus. There's other people there. Right. And you don't see any other potential love partners for, I don't remember how many minutes, but like a good chunk of time. And then... Alex brings home this guy, Larry, and they're mean to him. And then Stuart brings home the girl that you're talking about where they're all talking about her behind her back. And then they set up Eddie with another guy because they want him to get laid or whatever. And that doesn't go well. And that one isn't like mean spirited. That is just them trying to do something nice but it doesn't go well eddie isn't attracted to the other person played by alexis arquette by the way but they are their own thing no one else is allowed in their threesome you know even if it's not a sexual threesome it's just only them and they were doing that forcing people out i mean they were legitimately trying to do that to keep it themselves. I don't think they knew consciously that they were doing that, but I think they were doing that in order to keep it just them three. This character uh, that Josh Charles uh, plays, he's gay, and this is 1994. It's not that long ago, but in terms of like gay timeline, that's a long time ago. There were very few, like it could be zero, but very, very low number of people that were out uh, in my grade. Uh, but certainly like today, there are more people comfortable with this. So I think this film does kind of handle uh, that he's, it's very awkward and he doesn't want to announce he's gay and he's scared about it. And I do appreciate that because at first I was kind of like, oh, you know, it's, it's not so bad. But I'm like, well, it's 1994, so it's not so easy. I, I think the movie did handle that well. What it definitely didn't handle well was Stewart's constant use of the F word. Right. And I didn't remember all of that in there and it is excessive and bad and the jokes about being gay that Stuart said were it was horrible unless there was a huge heartfelt redemption which there wasn't yeah i mean let's not be in denial here in 1994 this was a word that was thrown around a lot more i i think what was kind of wrong about the way that eddie comes out is that in the movie, they sort of conflate being asexual with being gay, where mm. he says that maybe he's asexual. And then Alex says, no, I think you're just asexual. And there's nothing wrong with being asexual. That's different from being gay. And they sort of like mix those two up. That to me was kind of weird. I think his quote-unquote asexuality is very confused. He's a good-looking guy. He probably has been uh, hit on by girls, and Lara von Boyle is beautiful. 
the fact that he's not attracted to this gorgeous girl, he might think he's asexual. I, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't put it past someone to at least think he is, not because he's not attracted to guys, but because I'm not attracted to women, which is supposed to be, I guess, the default in 94. Right. And Alex doesn't accept the fact that Eddie is gay because she likes him. That's wrong. But I could also sort of see it as maybe realistic from like a selfish, horny 19 year old college student of like, oh, you think you're gay. You're wrong. I'll quote unquote fix you. That's a horrible attitude and a shitty attitude. And again, if it's a liberal elite university, you would hope that at least today someone would be more progressive and say, okay, you are who you are. That's fine. But you can kind of imagine that kind of attitude. I would actually use the word, it's ignorant. It's not the first time that a person's thought that they could fix someone. And Stuart, even to his credit, despite the fact that he's throwing the F word around and saying inappropriate things, he's okay with the fact that his buddy's gay. He's not like weirded out or mad or upset about it. But that part of the love triangle is unexplored. Or maybe not totally unexplored, because they do have this scene where Eddie talks to Stuart and says, I think you're gay. And uh, Stuart's like, nope. But like, they don't really explore that. Like, Alex and Eddie and Alex and Stuart, those parts of the love triangle, they really explore. Eddie and Stuart, they kind of just don't. Well, during the, the actual threesome later on, you see that Stuart kind of embraces Eddie and it kind of, to me, made me think that maybe he was a little curious. I'm glad you brought that up. I interpreted that moment as not sexual, but intimate. Like they are sharing an intimate moment. They are sharing a connection. And Stuart is okay with that. And Eddie's okay with that. And it's sweet. It's a really nice moment, but not sexual. And That leads to an awkward question. During this titular threesome, my interpretation of what we see is that, God, I can't believe I'm going to use these words. Uh, Stuart is penetrating Alex and Eddie is not. Eddie is like there too. Emotional support. I guess. And, you know, of course... You don't need penetration for there to be sex. And Eddie is having sex. He is involved in this threesome. But he's just kind of there. Right? Except for that one moment where Stuart touches him and, like, puts his hand on his butt. Like, there's not much that Eddie is doing there. And I kind of thought that was weird. Like, if you're going to call your movie threesome and you're going to have this exploration of sexuality and it's all culminating in this one big moment with these three characters who you gave top billing to all three of them. There should be more sex between all three of them. And I feel weird saying this as a straight guy, but like, yeah, there, there should have been more gay stuff in that scene. Yeah. I think today they would have said the word, he's a little fluid in his uh, sexuality. And, you know, generally, like, uh, you know, a, a straight man is, is not going to be sexual with another straight man. And it's not the kind of thing you do as a favor to your buddy that that's gay. But if he himself, I guess you could maybe say on the Kinsey scale, some of the, you know, gay tendencies, then that would make sense. But it just seems like he's the straight guy. Maybe they should have shown a little bit of uh, maybe a little attraction or something. I agree. There was not enough between Stuart and Eddie to actually make it the threesome that you would expect from the overall movie. Right. Yeah, you know, maybe they would have even been daring enough to have the two guys kiss and that would have been, right. you know, because maybe you could have made it like a look before a kiss that could maybe show just without a voiceover that, yes, I've always loved you or, or something like that. But uh, I was just kind of confused uh, about it because I was wondering, I, I actually, I mean, obviously this is not a rated, uh, you know, I guess back then would be called NC-17. I actually didn't know, Al. I 
thought maybe he was having sex with her. So I was like, oh, so he is bisexual. I thought maybe they were both penetrating her it's it's not very clear but but if it maybe it was clear to you guys then then it does confuse me more eddie and alex did have sex at one point right right but but th- that doesn't necessarily make him uh d- bisexual especially in 1994 several uh, gay people i know had had sex with girls before and they would consider right. themselves completely gay i thought there's a lot in here that they could do with the sexuality they just kind of they just shot and missed. I think there are a lot of dominoes set up here, but it, it just doesn't work. I, I don't think they shot and missed. I think they didn't take the shot because to your point, Dan, Eddie and Alex do have sex. Eddie is gay and he has sex with Alex because he's just going to try it. And Stuart is straight and Stuart does not have sex with Eddie and does not just try it. And to your point, James, like it's more common for a gay man to try having sex with a woman than it is for a straight man to try having sex with another man. I think the reason for that is because of just, you know, the heteronormative belief in society where if you assume that being straight is quote unquote correct, then yeah, sure. A gay man might give it a shot, might try to have sex with someone of the opposite gender just to see okay, then you can prove that it doesn't work and all right, fine, no harm, no foul. But if it goes the other way, no, 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 that is that is not okay. That is frowned upon. That is breaking that quote unquote normalcy. And, you know, of course, today we can be enlightened and progressive and say, no, that's bullshit. If you're a straight man and you have sex with a man and then you realize, nope, didn't like that. Okay, neat, whatever, who cares? But Also, I think it is worth pointing out that this movie starts with voiceover specifically about the word deviance. He says that they are deviant and they engaged in deviant behavior. And you could argue that maybe in 1994, this was all deviant behavior. I don't really think any of it is particularly deviant by today's standards, Maybe there are some very conservative people who would disagree with me, but gay, straight, fluid, whatever, those things are words that we know. Hell, even the word thruple, like the fact that that's a word that we all know kind of makes it less deviant and less shocking altogether. I I don't know any thruples personally. There aren't any uh, in the PTA meetings that I've been to that I know of, maybe maybe there are, but like just the fact that the term exists kind of proves that, yeah, you know, whatever. Oh, no, they're definitely out there. I have patients that are in uh, their thruple parents and uh, their siblings and they have two different moms. And so I guess they're half siblings and they have one dad. They all live together. I've been seeing them for years. Sometimes one mom brings the two kids in. Sometimes I see the other mom. This definitely goes on. Dan, do you have any thruple friends in Ohio? Uh, no. Uh, oddly enough, I don't. Not me. But Ohio is a predominantly Republican conservative state, and uh, you don't see that much here. Not saying that it isn't happening, but you don't see it that much. Got it. Okay. <laughs> My big problem with this film... At the climax of the film, they have this threesome finally, and and the voiceover basically goes, and then three weeks later, Alex moves out. Well, what happened for those three weeks? That's a long time. You guys live in the same room. And then it's like, and then Stuart, I never really saw again. And then years later, I saw he was straight, and uh, I'm gay with a man, and uh, Alex, uh, she never got with anyone. She's still single. It's as if there was a whole third act to film and the producers showed up one day and were like, uh, we ran out of money, guys. Like, we have no money. Uh, but no, we have this whole, like, the threesome totally changes the dynamic of everything. And, and there's this slow devolution and they part ways. And like, yeah. So what you're going to do is you're just going to end the movie at the threesome and just voice over, say, and Poochie died on the way to his own planet. And let's wrap it up. Come on, guys. We have 60 seconds of studio time here. That's what really annoyed me about it. Where's the ending or the concluding arc? I, I very much was annoyed by that. So 
Arg did not like that. I think the whole pregnancy scare scene could have been completely written out too. Yes, and it had that very uh, out of time, uh, you know, it uh, does not stand the test of time, uh, instance that we saw in, which movie was it, Al? Uh, Reality Bites, where there's this really complicated uh, pregnancy test. You got to mix uh, fluid A and fluid B, mix them together, and then pour it into vial C after waiting five minutes. Then you wait another 10 minutes. I think it was singles, not Reality Bites. Uh, maybe it was singles, yeah. And like that joke, honestly, it probably was funny in the 90s, but man, that doesn't hold up. Right, right. I think that the idea of a pregnancy scare is extra interesting in a threesome, but like we were talking about, and I have to say the word again, if there was no penetration from Eddie, then it's not as complicated as you might think. It's Stuart. Right. Like, yes. I mean, Eddie did have sex with her before that, but was it recently? I don't know. I did feel like the movie didn't do a great job of time stamping. Like I had no sense of how long things had passed. Like maybe that was earlier that week. Maybe it was a month ago. I have no idea. But like, yeah, if you're going to do a pregnancy scare in a threesome movie, sure. Cool. That can up the tension but then you really should make it clear that both of the men have had sex with the woman because, you know, biology. <laughs> That's just how it works. Yes. Yeah, I, I did not like this part. All right. Well, now that we've come to the end of the movie, Dan, I will ask you first. Do you think that Threesome stands the test of time? Absolutely. It's the greatest movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not even come close to standing the test of time. Uh, between all of the vulgar language towards gay and the community and the horrible acting, I don't know why I like this movie, but I still <laughs> like it. I, I know it does not stand the test of time, but I will still watch it probably once a year. <laughs> That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You're you're allowed to have a guilty pleasure to enjoy a movie even if it doesn't stand the test of time or whatever. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's just terrible. And I apologize that I made you guys watch all of that voiceover. All good. I feel horrible. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. No problem at all. James, what do you think? Did you think the movie stands the test of time? Um, first, I, I, I do like me some Josh Charles. He's, he's a good actor. Uh, I don't know Larfin Boy's work as well, but uh, again, we talked about this earlier. I thought the actors did the best they could with this. Um, I also think that in the beginning, at least, they handle uh, the confusion of his sexuality. Uh, I thought they handled that well. Um, you could call it a train wreck because before it's this smashed up thing that doesn't work it has the potential to be a like a really intact train the premise is kind of cool and it's a i thought a stupid way to get the three people together but once you have three 18 year olds together in a in a believable way you could have a lot of interesting stuff happen there is a lot you could do with the sexuality I actually thought this is basically a, a modern uh, Shakespeare. This is a Midsummer Night's Dream. This is As You Like It. Like It's the classic love triangle. It almost seems obvious. Like, just rip it off. It, not rip it off, but just do 10 things I hate about you. It's an update of The Taming of the Shrew. You know, they do this stuff all the time. I thought that's where they were going, and the potential was there. I thought the execution was horrible. Uh, and something you said, Dan, you know, you find yourself watching it and I don't think I'm going to watch it again, but I know why you watch it. And a long, long time ago, one of the single digit episodes, I believe, or maybe in the teens, we reviewed a film that we both agreed doesn't stand the test of time. And that's The Wizard. And it just kind of holds a special place because you watched it at the right time in the theater. I watched it with my dad in the theater. So I understand why you watch it, even though, yes, I agree, this film does not stand the test of time. Al, uh, what do you think? <laughs> I think we know where we're going here, but uh, <laughs> let's let's give you a go. Sure. Well, here, I'll surprise you. I will talk about what I think is the best scene in the movie. 
And I'm not saying it facetiously or ironically. And that's when Eddie calls Alex and he's like apologizing to her. And he's using these big words because that's like Alex's thing. She likes big words and she gets turned on by how smart Eddie is. And while she's having this conversation, Stuart is going down on her. And that scene is actually good. It perfectly illustrates the threesome, and it perfectly illustrates Alex's dilemma. She likes this one thing about Stuart and this other thing about Eddie, and it's not easy to combine those two things in this one very specific situation. It works for her. I mean, that's not sustainable. It's not like a way she can have a a long-term relationship with these two guys, with one of them going down on her only while the other one calls and uses big words. But that's a good scene. That explains what is happening to Alex. Contrast that with a scene where Eddie is watching Alex and Stuart in the bath when they're flirting and kind of washing each other but not hooking up. And it's voiceover that says, man, if I could only combine them into one person, that would be great. That's not showing me your dilemma. That's not helping me understand what you're going through. That's you telling it to me in voiceover, which is annoying. And there's nothing even comparable with Stuart, you know, where he feels something towards Alex and something different towards Eddie. That part of the triangle is just kind of ignored. So you have one part which is done well, But it's really only done well in that one scene. Really, everything else in this movie is terrible and is not well explored. I 100% agree with you, James. There is so much potential in this kind of story. Tons and tons and tons. And they blow it. They blow it with a really shit script. A better screenplay could have turned this story into something really interesting and ahead of its time for 1994. And... That's not what we've got. What we do have is a story that feels really small, even within the context of these characters and their lives. Like at the NVO, it's like, oh, but we learned so much about ourselves. Did you? Did this thing impact you? Did it change the trajectory of your lives? It doesn't really seem like it. I saw on the uh, the trivia on IMDb that the screenwriter based this off of his own experiences It kind of just feels like a quasi-interesting story from a guy about like his college experience that if someone told it to you in five minutes at a party, you'd be like, oh, neat. But for a 90-minute movie, it really, really doesn't work. Also, in 1994, there was porn and you could find it, but Mm -hmm. it wasn't as easy to access as it is today. Right. So like... In 1994, a movie called Threesome, where you're going to see some stuff on the big screen, I could see how that would be alluring to young people who would maybe not have access to see that sort of thing really easily. And, you know, that could motivate people to want to go to the movie. Now, though, if you have an internet connection, you can see any kind of threesome you want in seconds. It's not really a big deal. Any kind. Yeah, sure. Two guys, one girl, two girls, one guy, three guys, three girls, whatever the hell you want. Throwing a goat. Sure, sure. Three girls dressed as Hitler. (laughs) Why the hell not? I'm sure you can find it. It's there. Um, There was one thing that actually surprisingly does stand the test of time about this movie. The one line, I think it's uh, Stuart who says it, Sex is kind of like pizza. Even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Like, I'd heard that. I'd heard that somewhere else in my life. I had no idea that it was from this movie. So, you know, that's something of an accomplishment to have one line that people remember, even if the rest of your movie is not memorable. One memorable line. Okay. Is this where this phrase comes from? (laughs) Because I've definitely heard that phrase a lot. I don't know. If, If they ripped it off, then shame on them. If it came from this movie, good on them. I don't really know. I also don't agree with that. I've had really bad pizza in my life. I, I don't know about you guys, but Dan, you're you're in Ohio. What's the yes. pizza situation there like? There's one on every corner, and about 50% of them are actually good. 
Okay. That's not terrible. Oh, I just had one other thing in my notes. I just saw there's a typewriter in the dorm room. That's like how they're typing up papers. Well, unless you're going to be like that guy today who's going to sure. type right yeah. into your dorm. <laughs> I only type on my 1926 Smith Corona. Right. Unless you're trying to be a hipster douchebag. Uh, but no, this movie definitely, definitely does not stand the test of time. And Dan, how dare you for making us watch it? <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I wouldn't have picked it. So good on you for picking an obscure movie that wouldn't have been on our radar. Very obscure. <laughs> but now we know. It's a good movie to shit on. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like James's one doormate in the co-ed bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> nice callback. Thank you. Bringing mm. it all back together. That's what we try to do here on the test of time. You know, we've had two of these uh, podcasts together. I, I got to say, I think we're going to have to make it at least a threesome of podcasts. We're going to have to have you back sometime. Happy to do it. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us, Dan. This was fun. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Of course. Of course. That's going to do it for us this week. Come back next week when we talk about Bullworth. I have never seen that movie, but I've always wanted to. Have you seen Bullworth? I have, but it's been many years. Probably, I think it came out when we were in college. Yeah, it, it's the 25th anniversary. Warren Beatty, Halle Berry. That should be interesting to check out. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I think Warren Beatty directed it. Oh, okay. But in the meantime, we want to hear from you guys. We are at Test of Time Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Let us know your thoughts on Threesome, the movie, on Threesomes in general. Hey, 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 wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hubba, hubba. Or, you know, maybe not. That's inappropriate. Whatever. Uh, but we will see you next time, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.